烧，银铃声，卡埃拉铃，阿萨卡哈拉铃，扎卡拉铃，早安，铃。Namaste. So now we continue with the Kaivalya Navanita, and the last time we went over the qualifications. So just to review very quickly, the qualifications for enlightenment are viveka, discrimination between the temporary and the permanent; two, indifference to the enjoyment of pleasures. Here or hereafter. Three, the group of six qualities, and the six qualities are sama, control of mind; dhamma, control of senses; uparati, cessation of activities like material activities related to family and the body in general; tiksha is control of the passions, including endurance; samadhana. According to the sages, is settling down the mind, so it concentrates on the truth. And shraddha means faith in the master and the scriptures. And finally, the fourth quality is longing for liberation. Let me out of here. <laughs> so now let's continue with verse eleven. No one can achieve anything in the world without being properly equipped for the task. For the same reason, only those who are equipped with these four categories of prerequisites can gain illumination. A novice cannot get it so readily. If so gained, it follows that the person has been successively purified in countless incarnations in the past. So. This is not the first time we've been here, huh? All the scriptures say this from the very beginning. In fact, it's almost like the first thing you learn in spiritual life about reincarnation, the round of births and deaths, huh? Karma and rebirth, samsara, etc. These are like the very first things you learn on the authentic spiritual path. We're not talking about the silly. Abrahamic religions, huh? They don't know anything. They used to, but they forgot about it, and because they got mixed up with politics, it became a big mess. But all the Eastern religions accept that this is not our first life, and the, here's the proof: Why are people born into different, different situations? Some are rich, some are poor, some are intelligent, some are stupid. Most are stupid, <laughs> and you find them with a vast different、uh, symptoms of preferences, tastes, knowledge, intentions, and so on. How is that possible if there is no prior cause? Now, of course, the materialist rascals will say. It's just a matter of chance,、huh? but we know in life nothing is really chance. Everything has a cause. Maybe chance is one of the immediate causes, but the the original cause is something much more intelligent. Look at this world. How can this beautiful, amazing? Inconceivable, sometimes terrifying world exists unless it was planned. You know, if there's a very complicated machine like a big computer or something, doesn't it require a, a scientist or someone knowledgeable to design it, an engineer to build it, a technician to maintain it? Without that, the whole thing would fall to pieces. Or it wouldn't work in the first place. So, in the same way, we look at this complicated construction of the world. There has to be a creator. There has to be something like karma to guide the process of cause and effect. And 
make sure that everyone gets exactly what they deserve. So when we get sick and tired of this, <laughs> when we finally come around to the point of saying, I want out, I don't want to be stuck in cause and effect anymore. I don't want to be stuck in a material body. That's when we start to approach the path. And then the other qualifications and prerequisites are added one by one as we do the work of sadhana. Verse 12. He alone is fit for knowledge, who, suffering from the three kinds of troubles rising from the self, the elements, and providence, hunger, thirst, and so forth, from heat, cold, rain, disease, and the like, from robbers, wild animals, etc. Squirmed like a worm, scorched by heat, and panted for a dip in the nectar of wisdom, so as to put an end to the series of rebirths. This is the first noble truth. We're suffering. Life is suffering. Consciousness is suffering. Existence is suffering. Why? Because it's temporary. That's the second noble truth. The cause of the suffering is the impermanence, the unsatisfactoriness, and the fact that the world is not self. If it was self, everything would go just the way we want. But it doesn't, does it? <laughs> So, this world is not self. It's unsatisfactory. Whatever we get in this world is never exactly what we want. And even if we get it, it's impermanent. So it goes away. So, once we get sick and tired of this, and we finally turn our attention away from the world, and start to look within, and start to develop the qualities that lead towards self-realization, huh? These are the lower levels of the four vadas. In the Dvaita Vada, we practice karma yoga, which means we practice the virtues, truthfulness, nonviolence, equanimity, and so forth. And we do a lot of religious rituals and penances, charity, and so on, to give us some good karma. Because unless we're at least a little bit out of suffering, how can we meditate? How can we approach the absolute truth? How can we study the scriptures? How can we even conceive of the idea of liberation unless we're in a fairly good material situation? So that means we have to cultivate good karma. So anyone who has a fortunate birth, where you have adequate wealth and shelter and other facilities, uh, adequate leisure time, because this path takes a lot of time. Somehow you have to arrange your life so that you have the time to do all of these necessities of sadhana. Without accomplishing these prerequisites, as we've gone over, then you're not fit to approach a real master. That doesn't happen until you have developed devotion and steadiness and determination dedication, and so many other good qualities. These are developed in the second stage of bhakti yoga, according, along with love. So one must have a love for God. One must have a love for truth. And one must be ready to dedicate oneself to the master. And then only can one approach the real path. Verse 13. As the desire for liberation grew, he became unconcerned about his wife, children, and property, ran away from them like an antelope which had extricated itself from the noose of the hunter, and sought a holy master and respected him with all his heart. See, so this is the thing. One has to become free from care for the world. All the way back in the very beginning of this series, Back in, I don't know, what was it, 2012, 2013? Huh? We did a series on existentialism called Being in the World. And this is one of the 
chief causes of the existential dilemma identified by Heidegger, care for the world. As long as we care about the world, either to enjoy it or dominate it or caring about what other people think of us or any kind of care for that outside, exterior reality, we're trapped by it. The needs and the attitudes and the whole process of the world then takes precedence over our own internal opinions, values, intentions, and so on. So this has to be remedied. This is the very first thing that has to be remedied before we're ready to approach a master. We have to become detached from the world. We have to become that we don't care about the world. We don't care what other people think. We don't care about our prestige in society. We don't care about money and so on. This has to become our mindset. This has to become our attitude. And this is called renunciation. Renunciation doesn't necessarily mean that we physically leave everything. But what it means is that we become inwardly detached. We don't care about it anymore. And if it gets in the way of our self-realization, then we're easily give it up. After eagerly saluting his master, he stood up and sobbed out his heart, saying, O oh Lord, I have suffered long the torture of worldly life, which is after all so false. Gracious master, save me by tearing off the cords which bind me to the five sheaths, so that my heart may be at peace. The five sheaths is also something we've been talking about for years. Huh? And they are the anamaya kosha, the physical body, pranamaya kosha, the energy body, manomaya kosha, the mental body, vijnanamaya kosha, the intelligence or causal body, and anandamaya kosha, the bliss body, consciousness, ecstasy. So when one realizes that these are not protections, these are not uh, coverings or bodies to, as, as, like a possession. Huh? They are actually a prison, a prison that holds us in conditional consciousness, in material life, in samsara, birth after birth. So as soon as we realize this, then we don't care about even our own body, mind, intelligence, and so forth. This is real detachment. And this stage has to be realized before one is actually ready to embark on the sadhana that leads to liberation. The master lovingly considered him like a tortoise its eggs, looked at him like a fish its eggs, and passed his hands over him like a bird its wings over its eggs, and said, there is a means to put an end to your rebirths. I will tell you, and if you act upon it, your rebirths will cease. So this makes reference to several Vedic passages. And again, it ties in with the Buddha's teaching that a tortoise doesn't sit on its eggs. The tortoise lays its eggs on the beach and goes back in the water. But she's always thinking of them. And the same way the fish lays its eggs in, I don't know, coral or sea plants or wherever, and then watches over them. And so when the master sees the disciple, he first of all considers him. He observes the person. He thinks, can this one actually do the sadhana required for liberation? He evaluates the person. Huh? And if he feels that this disciple is actually ready, if, if the disciple passes the master's test, huh, survives his interview, <laughs> then the master blesses him, puts his hands on him, and 
begins the process of purification. And he says, there is a process that leads to the cessation of suffering. And this is the third noble truth. See, so all these things come together. They all fit together. All these authentic paths. And where we're at now, or where, where the story is, <laughs> is the beginning of the Vivartavada. The Vivartavada is the third level in the Chatra Darshana. And it's where the real meditation takes place. It's when the world is viewed as a mere appearance, not reality. The reality is inside. The reality is consciousness and awareness. So when that level is reached, then the disciple is ready for instruction. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. <laughs>